Corpus Christi, the solemnity of the most holy body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, is why we gather here today for the Holy Mass, a glorious celebration of the Church. The most holy Eucharist is source and summit of our Catholic lives, the launch of a historic Eucharistic revival in the United States, and here in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis begins today in a three-year revival throughout the country. And the dedication and the blessing of our newest sacred artwork depicting our patron saint, John the Evangelist, and his teaching on John chapter 6 on the Holy Eucharist and the Bread of Life Discourse. Arguably the most fundamental and profound defense of the truth of the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. My brothers and sisters, this is a glorious day, and I ask you an important and even perhaps life-altering question as we celebrate this holy day. What good is it if the ordinary elements of bread and wine, through God's grace of the consecration of the Holy Mass, or what we call transubstantiation, change or are transformed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, and our lives do not change or to become more like Him, transformed by Jesus? This is a question I proposed at a first Mass of Thanksgiving over 15 years ago on Corpus Christi Sunday in my home parish of St. Augustine in Rensselaer, Indiana. Just recently, in the last year, a year and a half, a Pew study came out that said that only one-third of all Catholics in this nation believe in the real presence of Jesus. Two-thirds believe that it's just symbolic, or it's kind of metaphoric, if you will. And so the question is relevant today, not just what good is it if we don't have our lives changed by Christ, but what good is it if people don't even believe in the real presence? This is a question that is as relevant to us today as it was to the earliest of Christians over 2,000 years ago. In the early church, St. Justin Martyr, one of the great church fathers, spoke about this very real presence. He said in one of his early teachings, and I quote, For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ, our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise have we been taught that the blood, the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word and for which our blood and flesh is transmutation by its transmutation are nourished is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. Transmutation. By transmutation we are nourished. The phrase for which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished is sometimes rendered in order to nourish and transform our lives, our flesh and blood. And the Greek here means something very similar to the word metabolize. So just as with physical food it becomes part of our bodies, through the spiritual food of the Eucharist, we become part of Christ's body. We eat Him, but rather than us metabolizing Him, He metabolizes us. What a profound and beautiful teaching of the early church, of one of the early church fathers, that the body, blood, soul, and divinity is meant to change us so that we're transformed into Him to be more like Christ Himself. The early ch the church that would go on to teach more beautifully in the, um, some centuries later by St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas says, O oh, precious and wonderful banquet that brings us salvation and contains all sweetness within it. Could anything be more in of more intri intrinsic value, he asks? Under the old law, it was the flesh of calves and goats that was offered. But here Christ himself, the one true God, is set before us as our food. What could be more wonderful than this, he says. No other sacrament has greater healing power. Through its sins are purged away. Virtues are increased and the soul is enriched with an abundance of every spiritual gift. And it is offered in the church for the living among us. So that that what was instituted for the salvation of all may be for the benefit of all. 
Thomas Aquinas speaking of you and I yet today, this great treasure that we have been given, the body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus. And of course, Jesus himself in the Bread of Life discourse in John chapter 6 goes on and on and on about the real presence in his teaching. He says things like this, do, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has sent, has set his seal. Amen, amen, I say to you, he says, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which com- comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, Sir, give us this bread always. And he says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. They doubted this, of course. The Jews murmured. That he said, "He said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven, they questioned. And he continues, Amen, Amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life, he says. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This bread, this Eucharistic bread come, that comes down from heaven, I give so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread, he continues. And they quarreled again among themselves over and over again. And he says, my flesh is true flesh. My blood is true blood. One who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have life eternal. And of course, we know the rest of the discourse when they found that difficult to believe. And many walked away from Jesus. And his response was to turn to his faithful disciples and say, Will you too leave me? And of course, Peter's famous words, To whom shall we turn, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, how can we possibly walk away from you in the Holy Eucharist? This wonderful gift that we've been given in the Holy Eucharist, this unfathomable gift, this great treasure of yet our day, is an unbelievable miracle that we get to receive Him, body, blood, soul, and divinity, through the Holy Eucharist. Today we dedicate a painting that significantly points to this Eucharistic God of ours, who points to the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. The painting, I'm going to um, share a little bit about its theological and its even practical meaning. If you look at the front of your worship aid, there is a picture of the painting. The painting is on the wall, so some of you can see it from where you sit, and others will not be able to see it more fully until after Mass. But if you'll follow along, I want to share in a short um, summation some of the great symbolism and some of the great theology that sits within this painting. I first want to share with you that it's such a great gift to have a sacred artist in our parish, Mike McCarthy, who has done all three of these paintings on the south transept. It's a sign of the many, many gifts and charisms of our parish life. And Mike, when I first asked him to do these three paintings, um, I don't know if he knew what he was in for, because I asked him of something else in addition to painting. I asked him if he would allow me, that has been kind of inspired by the Holy Spirit, to participate in both the theology of the paintings, but also to participate in selecting the people who would sit for the paintings. More about the people who sat for the paintings in a moment, but a little bit more about the theology that came inspired both through Mike and myself. I wanted to be Eucharistic. Little did I know that we'd be dedicating on the Feast of Corpus Christi 2022 at the launch of the Eucharistic Revival of the United States of America. Only God knew that at the time that this painting was commissioned. It is centered around about 48 to 50 A.D. John, who is the central figure in the painting, he's in green in the center of it, is seated on a rock teaching about the Holy Eucharist. We could say even teaching John chapter 6. This would be around the time of the first council, the first ecumenical council of the church, the Council of Jerusalem. It would be a time where John would be kind of a middle-aged John. We often see him depicted as young John, like in the stained glass window above the sanctuary here, with his head on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. Or we sometimes see him as the old John, which is in the stained glass window in the back of church, on the island of Patmos, writing the book of Revelations. But we rarely see John as a middle-aged John, as you'll now view him here in our newest sacred artwork. 
He's middle-aged, John. Now he's been so deeply influenced by Christ himself that he's now teaching about Jesus and the great gifts that he's left us in the Holy Eucharist. He is central to the painting, and his green garment reflects the green in the young John that you'll see in the Stations of the Cross. So in our stations that were painted over a hundred years ago by a French artist of Chauvet, now is kind of pulled into to connect with this middle-aged John. He's also wearing what we might call um, an ancient stole representing priesthood of the young John. He is, as you see, is, has his hand on his heart, which is the burning heart of the sacred heart of Jesus, which he has embraced himself. And his other hand is in what we would call an orance, which a priest is often in during the consecration or during Mass. The orance is a hand pointed to the Eucharist. And so you can see that he's a priest pointing to Jesus Christ. And we can even take it further to say that he is pointing to Jesus here at the altar, the sacrificial victim who's given to us for all eternity. And he's even pointing to Jesus in the Holy Tabernacle here at our church. So there's significant meaning in where his hand is pointing and the the, uh, posture of his hand. But both hands, the sacred heart which he has embraced and a hand that points to Christ in the Holy Eucharist. You can see too that There is a young disciple that sits at his feet. This young disciple is closest to St. John, recalling how John was the youngest apostle and beloved by Jesus himself. This figure invites us to consider the early church fathers, St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Polycarp, St. Papias. They were all apostolic fathers of the early church. They were hearers, direct hearers of the apostle John. And this day, the future St. Ignatius of Antioch would have been a teenager. And thus, the young disciple who is gazing into his eyes is learning from the apostle beloved by Jesus himself. This great gift of the early church reminds us that of the apostolic faith that has been passed on to us for so many generations. The great gift of the deposit of the faith. A young woman is also um, gazing into uh, to, to John as he's teaching. And she is stirred to true devotion as she listens to John. Her enthusiasm is conveyed by, she's been kind of brought forward in the painting. She is kneeling um, among others there in a reverence. We can even say that she is kneeling in reverence like to the Holy Eucharist as she's learning about more fully the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. It's a reverence that we do every time that we come into the church to bow down, to kneel to Christ our Savior. And of course, every time that we adore Christ in the Holy Eucharist in adoration, we kneel before Him or we genuflect before Him. She represents true, also a true purity of heart to receive the words of John and the words of Jesus. And she could, we could say she even represents the purity of the gift of the consecrated life, of religious life. As well then, as we continue in the painting, we see that we move up to the right side and we see that Mary sits under a shade tree as the highest place in the painting. The tree is a symbol of God's favor upon her. It also recalls the Garden of Eden and presents Mary as a new Eve. Resting in in the shadow of the tree, in the shade of the tree, we're reminded that she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. As she receives that gift of the Holy Spirit, that she receives Christ, the Christ child, into her womb. And that same Spirit now is upon her as she then also teaches about the Holy Eucharist given to us. So we're not left orphan, but given the great gift of the sacrifice of the Blessed Sacrament. We could say, too, that as Mary is, has her arm extended, that she is extending her hand to Christ, pointing her hand to Christ. There are four figures in the entire painting with their hands outstretched, and all of them are pointing then to the teaching of Jesus Christ and His true presence in the Holy Eucharist. As we move, as we continue to move through the painting, then we can see also that Mary 
Mary is teaching a young woman um, that is at her feet. The young woman gazes into the eyes of Mary with this great joy upon her face as if she is hearing something that is not only true, but supernaturally beautiful. And so there's kind of a transcendent look upon her face of truth and love that is being extended to her as Mary shares the good news of the Holy Eucharist with her. And then another young woman that sits down below Mary and kind of to the right of the painting that is gazing both to the other young woman as if she is kind of a role model for her, right? As she sees the truth being spoken through Mary about Jesus and the Eucharist, she's looking up to another to say, wow, this role model of mine also sees, uh, I see what she sees and I believe what she believes. There are, in that same area, there are two young women, the one kneeling, the one young man then, um, who's gazing in the eyes of John and the young woman on the right, which we could say represent the three young children that were presented um, to the children, the children of Fatima. There are two key elements of the apparitions of our Blessed Mother of Fatima, with the reverence for the Holy Eucharist and the devotion of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so we see kind of a resemblance of that great gift of the, uh, the gift of Fatima and the gift of the apparition of our Blessed Mother. As we move to the bottom left of the painting, we see two couples there. Um, they're exuberant, they're joyful, they're full of life. Uh, they're both married couples. The one that is standing looks to be a newly married couple because they're dressed more elaborately. Uh, they, they are dressed as if they have just been married. There's great um, symbolism of even the wedding of Cana in this portrait, in this painting. And I'll, I'll hit more on that in just a minute. But there's this beautiful gift of that appearance of this newly married couple marked by the finer clothing and the woman's headdress. Some research suggests that when Jesus shared the parable of lost coin, he was referring to a coin that had fallen off of the woman's wedding diadem. And so a reflection of that great gift of, of, of the gift of wedding and marriage. Kneeling uh, below there are, is another couple, kneeling and cutting sitting. And the kneeling man helps the eye move, move upward towards the bride. The woman that is then pointing to the child is teaching about the Eucharist, even to the youngest of children. The symbolism is that no one's too young to hear about the truth of God and the Holy Eucharist. And that we must pass on this great gift to all of our children from the earliest of days. There's also this kind of, again, pointing back to the great gift of the wedding of Cana. And that moves us into the fallen man who is on the right, in the bottom right portion of the portrait of the painting. He's kind of washing his feet in a puddle below him. And this washing of the feet represents the ceremonial washing jars that Jesus used as he was at the wedding of Cana. Remember when he said, give me what you got. And they filled those jars with water per his request. These were washing jars for the ceremony of washing and preparing for the great feast. There's also in the, in the um, in that same bottom right hand corner a young man who's holding uh, a, a bundle of grapes. Of course, we know grapes represent the Eucharist of that wine that Jesus will change the water into wine, the great fruitfulness of our lives and the fruitfulness of married life at the wedding of Cana that we see it represented in this painting. This is the real presence of Jesus that is given to fortify marriage and strengthen families of all kinds. It is the Eucharistic blessing that we see in the wedding of Cana. And Jesus' first miracle when he could have done anything like he did, raise people from the dead, heal them from sickness and blindness and from leprosy. But he chose to turn water into wine to be a Eucharistic symbol then of the fruitfulness of our lives that are meant to change when we receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus and go forth to be fruitful in the world in which we live. Finally, you can see uh, at the bottom of the hand of John, behind the rocks, there's someone walking away. This is someone who is doubting or very troubled by the teaching of the Holy Eucharist, the figure who maybe is rejecting or struggling with the teaching. As we often maybe have in our own lives, struggle with some teaching of the church, as sometimes people do struggle with teaching, as many have rejected the teaching of the church, this man represents that rejection or that struggle. 
We don't know the rest of the story, of course. We hope that it also represents a man who comes back to Jesus after leaving him or after hearing this teaching by John. Some found it hard, the saying hard to believe and left him. The question is, will we stick with Jesus as did so many others on that particular day in the days after as John was teaching about the Eucharist? Well, there's so much more symbolism and representation in this painting. For the sake of time, that's a snapshot of what uh, the gift of this great painting that we have uh, embraced today in our holy church. I want to just spend just a moment now on the significance of the characters. They represent our parish. One of the great gifts of my priesthood was to be able to pray through who God do you want to sit for these paintings. And as we'd sit with that and pray about it, God would then bring forth people um, to be able to be asked to represent the parish life. There are two traditional parishioners in the painting. Those long-time, rock-solid, steadfast faithful of our parish that have built this church for 185 years. What would we be without the traditional, steadfast, faithful wisdom of this parish? There are eight young adults in the painting representing the thriving young adult community that we experience today in addition to that traditional steadfast community. They represent the young adults in this community who have remained faithful or have had conversions or reversions to the church. There are three children, two are teenagers and one an infant, representing families and children, the fruitfulness of family in our parish life and the growing families among us. There are two converts in the painting. One is a convert from from the Protestant faith, and one is a Muslim convert to the Catholic faith, showing that God calls people from all walks of life and all religious backgrounds into a fullness of Catholicism, a fullness of the faith of the church. There are two in the paintings who have reversions, who were raised Catholic but had reversions back to the Catholic faith over time. There are married couples, as I already pointed out, representing the vocation of sacred married life. There are sacred singles, representing those who are single and living a sacred single life. John is actually now a priest. He's a priest of the Holy Cross uh, Order of Notre Dame. And their their young woman kneeling is uh, in formation as a religious sister. Most appropriately, she is studying to be a sister of the Franciscans of Perpetual Adoration in Mishawaka, Indiana. Could we have asked God for a more fruitful blessing of those um, representatives of the vocations of our church? We also see the active life of our parish now today, a parish council member is represented of various ministries in our church, the sacramental life is represented, our campus ministry which has been so fruitful on the campus of IUPUI with our Catholic student organization, our focused missionaries, the Notre Dame Echo Apprentice, the Formation Houses of Blessed Peer Giorgio Frassati and St. Teresa of Calcutta. And finally, I would propose that this painting represents our past, present, and future. It represents a rich historical and this rich heritage of St. John's in the heart of our city as the oldest Catholic church here in Indianapolis. It also represents who we are today, this thriving community of faithful, all of us. And it represents a future full of hope for what God yet has in store for this parish. We thank God this day for the gift of celebrating His holy body, blood, soul, and divinity. We thank Him for the Eucharistic revival which launches today throughout the United States and here locally. And we thank Him for this great gift of the holy sacred artwork of St. John the Evangelist, pointing us even more closely to the great gift of the Holy Eucharist and His real presence among us. And so I ask my brothers and sisters once again, what good is it? What good is it if the ordinary elements of bread and wine become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ are transformed, are changed, and our lives are not transformed and changed when we receive Him? What good is it if we walk out of here having received Christ Himself and are not more Christ-like in our lives? May this Corpus Christi Sunday, we recommit at an even higher level of being the hands and feet and voice, the changed person that represents Jesus Christ in our world, and that we recommit to sharing that great truth with everyone that we encounter. 
May it be so as we dedicate this most beautiful painting this day in honor of St. John the Evangelist and in great reverence to the Holy Eucharist itself.